Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. America's going bananas. Two mass shootings on the 4th of July, as if that's a celebration of our new national identity. Supreme Court decisions making America great again by bringing us back to the 1950s. A failing economy. A failed foreign policy. In the twilight of our empire, we're not going gentle into that good night. Our rage against the dying of the light is a global temper tantrum. From his perch at the Chapo Trap House podcast, Felix Biederman has been an acerbic observer and commentator, and I'm so excited to have him on today. Felix, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm excited to have you on, and I have like so much I want to talk to you about. Obviously, huge fan of the show. I'm sure a lot of our Viewers at Breakthrough News are also huge fans of the show, so let's just get right into it. I think a good place to start is, um, you know, why? Let's start with what happened recently with like all these mass shootings over July Fourth. I want to get your take on this because you know I've lived outside of the U.S. for a few years now, and I'm not there to really understand culturally what's taking place. I don't get why America has so many of these mass shootings. I don't know if it's just like lonely losers and. As you know, like I live in Lebanon where practically every house here has an AK-47 in it. Mm-hmm. You can like see guys on scooters with pistols tucked into their pants. And you see these like former and current militia men, you know, whether it's your average like fascist Lebanese forces guy or like your, you know, whatever ML guy. You see them um, like with their pistols tucked in their pants. They have access to RPGs, heavy machine guns, grenades. And yet, you know, apart from some like road rage or like criminal violence in the sort of impoverished periphery, it's like much safer, I feel like, in Beirut than the U.S. And nobody's worried about mass shootings or school shootings. And even in like Syria, Iraq or Yemen, where there's horrible wars or has been horrible wars and like ISIS and Al Qaeda, the violence was at least easier to understand. You know, you had Al Qaeda like blowing up Shias because of a certain ideology or like armies targeting insurgents because there's a war. But there was never any of this kind of violence without a logic to it, even if it was evil. So what's what's your take on what's going on here? Well, um, it, it, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if you've read uh, Mark Ames book, uh, Going Postal. Mm, about uh it's a good one. you know oh yeah yeah it's a, it's a great book and it's about sort of the older iterations of mass shootings uh going postal for you know people who are younger people who don't know uh it referred to there are these well publicized incidents of postal workers going into their place of employment or former place of employment usually after they were fired and killing their co-workers i mean it was it was um Statistically, postal workers were less likely to kill their co-workers than other Americans. But it was like at the time a uniquely American thing. You know, you, you just something in your life goes wrong, something in your job goes wrong. You respond by killing your co-workers, maybe killing your boss sometimes, but you know, definitely killing a few people who had nothing to do with it. Um, and what people have said is that in the past uh past uh couple decades, that the the profile of the mass shooter like the age has gone down uh it's it's not so much that you go in and kill your co-workers though that still happens and you know we're seeing more and more young people do it and i i don't think there's any like singular pithy reason you could put on why this is such an american thing i think there are a bunch of reasons and i think um none of them completely make everyone happy yeah but i i do think you know one thing is that we, I don't know. I, I it's a unique, it's a unique expression of a lack of belief in a future for a place that mm-hmm. um, is typically and has typically been for the past like hundred or so, way or way more than that years, an illogically optimistic place. That's what people have always <laughs> said about Americans is that there's just like this insane optimism, and now there's less of a popular shared concept of a future. Uh, I, I think. In addition to that, like, yeah, there's a there there's access. But as he stated, there are countries where, you know, there's equal access or even greater access to destructive weapons. You don't see this exact uh, type of thing. Um, I mean, it's it's hard to it's hard to look at what the American empire has done, you know, over time and, and not not think, you know, does does the frontier come home or not? 
Mm-hmm. Does this mm-hmm. affect people's behavior or not? And of course, you know, there's a, there's a billion other things. I think we have a, a unique type of mentally ill young man, right? Yeah, yeah. In America. You know, I actually, I actually real quick, just like to kind of, because of what you said about American empire or whatever, I thought this was really interesting. Every time there's like a mass shooting, some obnoxious politician has to make this reference where it's like, that belongs over there, not here. And I just want to show one of those obnoxious politicians saying that. I'm going to show this video real quick. Here we go. So today I will go home and hug my babies a little tighter in gratefulness that they are safe. But I think about the babies and the families who lost moms and dads and grandparents today. And we must and must do more. I just listened to the sound of that gunfire from one of the... um, videos that was captured and let me tell you that the last time i heard a weapon with that capacity firing that rapidly on the fourth of july was iraq it was not the united states of america we can and we should and we will do better (laughs) yeah that's 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 tammy Tammy Duckworth. yeah yeah lovely i love that i love that it's like well actually like you heard those weapons in iraq because you invaded iraq and i like that she mentioned on the fourth of july too like i don't know just is on the fourth of july where like american soldiers just like firing their machine guns i don't know (laughs) um but yeah i just what you said about like sort of empire coming home i just thought that was a good thing to add there but you also mentioned this kind of loneliness basically and it's it's interesting because the international red cross had the statement during covid about loneliness. It's like this loneliness crisis and the World Health Organization has given loneliness a code. They recognize it as like a concern. The UK has a ministry of loneliness. The Japanese do too. Um, They even have a word for people who die alone and undiscovered, which is just really sad. So is this something about capitalism? But then it also seems like only America has regular mass shootings again. Like it's not happening in the UK and Japan. So I don't know. How do you make sense of that? Well, I, I think I think there's all it's all a similar thing that happens in I mean, not just the West. I mean, I, I guess you can expand West to mean anything. But I mean, it does, you know, this happens in uh, this happens in South Korea. This happens in Japan, that there is a sense of like general isolative loneliness and uh, apathy or non-belief in a future. And uh, it manifests with people in different ways in some like America has a weirdly low suicide rate compared to like our okay or a lot of uh you know vaunted nordic countries but a much higher rate of this seemingly um mm. but i i think there is all the same loneliness in a lot of these countries i think it's hyper accentuated in america just because of our uniquely american things uh of how weird we are among countries of our <laughs> wealth and size of not really having a safety net of already having more of a cultural individualism in a lot of these places um i the, the problem is like you know what do you do um yeah. i I've, I've 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 said a bunch of times that i think um phones as they have existed in the past 10 10 to 15 years are among one of the worst things for the general human experience um yeah. I, I i you know i'm old enough now where at least when I was a kid, I remember kind of how it was before phones and you, you want to be cautious, right? Because it's like, you don't want to, you don't want to give a broad, uh, a broad interpretation of what the world is like based on what it was your, your tree of life memories of from when you were a child, but it was markedly different, you know, even in the late nineties and early two thousands than it is now. Um, I, and I, uh, I don't know that you can ever really put the toothpaste back in the tube. <laughs> that's one way to. But, put yeah, it. I mean, I, I mean, there, there, that's. I don't even know. I don't even know if that would be enough at this point. If you had uh, incredibly strict regulations over who could have one, yeah, or, yeah, or you could make one that. There's like you know, too it, many. There's too many. Yeah, it's like I mean, it's like the gun buyback stuff. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> how do you even buy back? All I like of how them? that's the only way you can do it is to just give people money. To get their guns yeah. because they have nothing else. Then there's also like these incel guys and losers who go on shooting sprees. And that kind of reminds me of the sort of lone wolf uh, Al Qaeda, ISIS attack guy in the West, you know, where they have these similar backgrounds of like social alienation. 
and rejection, but that has an ideology. But like in the West, it, the incelism is not an ideology. Well, like, I mean, I, I think it's like kind of the same <clears throat> ideology in some ways. I mean, they're, they're okay. like, I mean, um, John Dolan has drawn the line between Wahhabism and sort of American Protestant uh, Calvinist attitudes. Even if like, even if a shooter is, you know, doing whatever try hard thing of pretending he's a pagan or whatever, it's still, you're still an American. <laughs> In the same way that, like, you know, every American who cares about politics is inescapably kind of a liberal, whether you like it or not. Um, if you're if you're an American uh, and especially like an American kind of right winger, you're a little bit of a Protestant, whether you're you say you're a Catholic or you say you're a pagan or whatever you say you are. Um, Even I yeah. feel like I am a little bit like yeah, it's, it's like a, a cultural yeah. thing. Like I like you because know, like you go to other countries and. For example, I know this is maybe a silly example, but people are not that nudity is not like a huge deal in other parts of the world. But like I have this very like puritanical, like instinctive reaction to it where I'm like, ah, yeah, I don't like no, like in a locker room. Right. Like it's like a really big deal for me to like. Ah. So it's it's it is a cultural sort of indoctrination in the U.S. of having that mentality. Yeah, you can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. Uh, you're, you're, you're going to have these, uh, things that you're a little bit weirder about than, uh, someone from any other country might be, um, for the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> you, you choose what to do with that, of course, but it's, I don't know. It, it's, it's in the same way where, you know, an American will either say like, oh, I'm a, I'm an integralist, you know, like I, I, I think there should be like a Catholic theocracy, or I, I'll even go as far as to say there should be a Catholic monarchy or, you know, I'm a, I'm a Maoist. But at the end of the day, they're talking about horse race politics because they're also liberals. You know, we all, yeah. are. we all are. Yeah. We're all, we're all liberals. We're all Protestants. We're all, we're, we're, we're all these things. You, but you, you have to choose what that means to you. You have to choose whether you go mad fighting that or you, you learn to live with your limitations and accept what the rest of your life means. Yeah. One of my really good friends here in Lebanon, it always says like to be an American leftist, you have to be crazy. Like you have to kind of be a little insane uh, because of kind of what you just said, where you have to go yeah. mad to fight that sort of internal like liberalism that you're that's forced down your throat just through American culture. But then, of course, like thinking about that Tammy Duckworth clip, like, do you also think it has something to do with our cowboy foreign policy? This guy, Peter Gowan, described it as neoliberal cosmopolitan and others have called it a liberal internationalist regime change under U.S. command, like this American philosophy that sees foreign governments as good or bad and its criteria are like free market and liberal democratic principles of course but the bad ones need to be overthrown by like international action and then americans just kind of take this for granted that we can just go over into the next town and shoot up the bad guys like they have this they, they like take that mentality that we have internationally and like kind of turn it inwards and they think they're like defeating the bads i don't know yeah yeah i um I you know, I, th I think we both agree that culture is downstream from politics, not vice mm -hmm. versa. As people like to uh, posit. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I don't I don't see how a country like ours could uh, kill, you know, possibly two million, possibly more in Iraq and then characterize it just as a, as a silly mistake, a tragic, silly mistake where the, the greatest tragedy of that, of course, is that you know perhaps perhaps we made some american soldiers sad along the way um <laughs> I, I i don't see how you can do something like that and then not impart onto people and especially young people uh sort of worthlessness of human life and annihilism and even if you sweep it under the rug and you don't talk about it like we don't talk about a lot of these things it has that effect and it, it affects every other part of the culture and it, yeah. when already lonely and uh unstable people with easy access to weapons see that um there are only a few places to go from there unfortunately it's like the michael moore sort of bowling for columbine argument that's been around for a while but like it never really you know makes it into mainstream coverage of this stuff but i want to i want to shift to a bit of a different topic because you know chapo trap house has been kind of like framed as the podcast of the DSA. I know you're not the podcast of the DSA, <laughs> um, but it's kind of viewed that way, right? Like in a lot of DSA people really like listen to Chapo and yeah. there's a connection there, right? So I just thought, you know, as the podcast of the DSA or one of the podcasters at the DSA, you know, it sometimes seems like the American left 
only exists online, especially because of the way it's portrayed and like battling over identity politics on social media and stuff like that. But on the other hand, you know, DSA and other grassroots organizations have actually made some headway and progress, I think, at the local level, uh, while also producing people, some of the bigger names, of course, being people like Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, you know, maybe we can include like Ayanna Presley and Jamal Bowman. Um, I know there's, I know that's a bit controversial with Jamal Bowman. We don't have to really go into that. Yeah. But like, I'm curious, like what, what you think about the sort of, maybe, you know, you don't have to talk about the American left altogether, but maybe even just like the DSA left, like the way it's portrayed versus what it actually does. Cause sometimes I think that like the le left gets crapped on so much when it actually does accomplish some things in certain parts of the country. I'm not saying we should praise it and the left is winning because it's certainly not, but I don't think it's really fair to just like for the left to just be portrayed like the way Tucker Carlson sees it, for example. Yeah. 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 I, 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 you know, I, I'm of, I'm of many minds of it. And I think if there is one singular thing that I could will people to stop doing people in DSA specifically to not do anymore ever again, it would be to have like, intra chapter and uh just intra organization fights in public i think that that that, that <laughs> is that is the that is the most discouraging thing i see um i think it discourages people more than anything else um i i i i i know a lot of people both in dsa and psl and one thing that i always thought psl did incredibly right is that they have very strict rules on how you conduct yourself as a member speaking your capacity as a member online uh i know not everyone agrees with both organizations on everything but i, I think we can agree that fighting over every single little granular inter-organization thing online in public and performing in that way is discouraging to everybody but yeah. uh you know then to also be fair I think so many of uh, DSA, in particular, the, uh, their successes are unheralded just because it, it is it is a, it is like an easy way, like get metrics, like make fun of this like DSA, like soy guy archetype. And it's like, yeah, sure, that guy exists, like a guy who wears a denim vest with too many buttons and, uh, uh, you know, says y'all despite growing up in New England. <laughs> but uh, the, the guy exists, but the, the, then there are also like, you know, there are annoying guys in everything. If, if you're an American who like is invested in politics in any way, you are as annoying as that guy. We're all him and we're all we're all the people at school board meetings and we're, we're every we're every unbearable person in this country put together. Um, <laughs> they, they uh, you know, I. DSA had a huge amount of success, um, surprising amount of success in Manhattan recently, in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is particularly interesting because, uh, you know, like five years ago or so, people talked about the DSA there as it was, you know, the basket case of DSAs in major American cities. Um, and local politics, you don't want to, it's not the be all and end all. And there are, particularly in America, uh, very discouraging looming things that um even, even if you won in to the top 20 major american cities um you wouldn't yet be be able to begin to take on but i i i i think there is a lot more to uh to the story than the the uh what people have done in the past two years i don't know i i Bernie losing was a big thing and it is mm -hmm. it was a humiliating loss. And I feel like people should really think about it, really think about what it means to uh, lose from the front runner position like that. Think about the way in which you lost. Uh, think about the types of people uh, the campaign hired and how it was run. But then again, I also think that a lot of people have shown themselves as, uh, you know, they they they. They were really into this when they thought they were going to win. Yeah. And they could not really take the humiliation of losing, which, you know, for them, unfortunately, I have to say, you know, welcome to the left in this country. It's, <laughs> right. not, it's not good. It's not good that it is lost this much, but it is um, it, it's going to be an uphill battle. Maybe yeah. it always will be. Who knows? It always has been. And I mean, yeah, yeah. there was a time. Yeah, there was a time when the like, I mean, the left is. 
you know, I'm, it's easy to be hard on the American left. And I am hard on the American left, especially because I don't live in the U S anymore. And it's easier to be from abroad, but at the same time, it's like, there have been concerted efforts to destroy it for decades. Um, and it's worked sometimes. And what's left of it is always like to sort of like climbing over like broken glass. <laughs> and it's hard. It's really hard. But, you know, on that note, I'm curious if you have anything to say about the UK, because like, while of course they may have excommunicated Jeremy Corbyn, they also kind of have their own squad of sorts um, with parliament members like, you know, Zara Sultana, uh, Bell Ribeiro and Absana Begum. I'm curious if you think that's the beginning of something or the end of something. I don't even know. Like, I don't know how well versed you feel about, you know, British politics in that sense. But if you have any comments on that. It's 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 hard to say. I um I don't I certainly like don't know well enough to give you a prediction. Uh, I will say the thing that I've always thought has been strange about the UK in the in the past, like. 12 or 15 years is uh how much it seems that they want to be like us politically <laughs> maybe awful. the only every every country wants to you know be like us culturally just because it's you know we're the dominant one it's uh, we i mean we could get into a whole thing over how american culture is created but um maybe the only country i've seen of its type where it's like no we want exactly what they have politically <laughs> they want to they want to jam like they want to jam like a type of like stupid American horse race politics into a parliamentary system in a way that's uh, hilarious. But um, uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's hard to call with them. Right. It's hard. It's hard to call anything with them. I, I don't yeah. I don't feel like I can confidently predict anything that will happen with them because they're they're, you know, on one hand, they have these things that are so much healthier than America. Right whether it is just having like a parliamentary system or it's having like some semblance of a safety net, obviously not nowhere near what it should be, but you know, at least having nationalized healthcare, which I think yeah. is, you know, a, a far, far and beyond way better than Medicare for all, you know, especially yeah. I would think like, especially in America, you would just have to nationalize this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I yeah, I, I don't see how you just do insurance in this country where every, everything is just, you know, at best rent seeking behavior. Um, but then they are, you know, we talked about the effects that, um, the crimes of an empire have on people. I mean, what, what do you think, what do you think that does for them? Uh, because they were, you know, the we, empire, we, yeah, <laughs> they, they were, were the yeah. empire for yeah. a long time before we took you, the mantle. You could argue that they, uh, you know, they're they're in some ways singularly responsible for how the world is today. Yeah, America is actually a product of the UK for the most mm -hmm. part. And I mean, European settler colonialism and all that fun stuff. But then moving back to like U.S. domestic politics, there have been, of course, past decisions when the Supreme Court changed the law in controversial ways that were meant to keep up to date with changes in society. Um almost as if it were like following trends, or at least it was like in tandem with the trends. But with the recent Dobbs decision on abortion, it seems like the Supreme Court has become, it doesn't seem, it has become this like reactionary force just supporting an ideological agenda that, you know, most Americans actually reject. And I think it's even worse because a lot of these judges were appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote. So like, it just feels like we're, we've entered this bizarre new era with the, especially the recent decisions that came through. And now they're talking about like maybe doing stuff, you know, to limit contraception, access to contraception and undoing gay marriage. I mean, like, what does this mean for, I, I guess, what, what does this say about America that like we have this court that's been taken over by these right-wing ideological psychopaths who actually are trying to turn back the clock. They sort of seem like the heirs of like segre the, of segregationists. Well, I think with a, a lot of those, um, uh, you know, you're talking about with like the how pre people previously uh, conceive of uh, what a Supreme Court like landmark decision is, the ones that people remember, the one that the ones that like grant people freedoms and rights. Um, you know, th that that is that was one function of the court in one version of America where the court, you know, will see a changing society and to keep, you know, grant itself continuing legitimacy. will go, okay, yeah, fine. You can do that. Um, I think now, you know, if I had to 
pick some meaning from the tea leaves over this last uh, spate of decisions, it would tell me that we're at the end of something. What what that means, I don't really know. I, I don't know what comes next. I, I, I don't know what the end exactly looks like. But, you know, seeing this, like the Supreme Court has always been like a reactionary institution, right? But it, it's, especially Dobbs, it strikes me as acting in the way that like, you know, Republican state legislatures do, where with social issues, you always have to up the ante. Right. You always have to you always have to get more aggressive. You always have to get like more restrictive and find more and more punitive things because it's never going to be enough. You're never you're never going to satisfy like any socially conservative lobby or voting base where they're like, okay, we we did it. We're done. You got us forever (laughs) because it's they they they're always going to need something to go after. And seeing the court act like that, like to going above and beyond with that is i mean it that does tell me we're at the end of something and it does yeah. tell me that like you know i don't think i don't think biden is any spring chicken nor is anyone on the incredibly shallow democratic bench but it is the end of some type of legitimacy for the supreme court and what that so. means i don't i don't i don't really know again because it's like they could be illegitimate in the minds of 65 to even 75 percent of Americans over the course of 20 years. And it could mean nothing electorally. It could mean nothing yeah. electorally for 30 years, you know. It's but cra- I know it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I think. No, I think you're right. And I want to go back to the issue of like Democrats and how spineless and useless they are. But I really I, you know, I want to ask you about something kind of completely unrelated, which is. You know, you're into MMA. You've even like you even did like a multi part documentary on MMA. And, you know, we don't associate the so-called like dirtbag left with the sort of alpha male brutality of mixed martial arts. And the reason I raise this is because it brings me to another subject. And I mean this in the nicest way possible. And I'm half joking, but I'm a little serious. How come leftists aren't into like the workout exercise culture? Like, I, and I know you I know you're really into like you know, gym stuff and the MMA stuff. And, you know, I've done CrossFit and I mean, our rivals go to CrossFit gyms, like our, our ideological rivals, they go to CrossFit gyms. CrossFit is really dominated by right wingers. Um, and then like the left kind of like goes to yoga classes, which is fine. Like yoga can make you super strong. I'm not trying to like say anything negative about yoga. Um, but how are we going to get ready for like the coming civil war if the left isn't into <laughs> bro workout culture? No, I'm joking. But, you know, I, I and a little bit I kind of mean it. like I kind of mean it in the sense, culturally speaking, like why is it that the left isn't doesn't have like, a place in that culture at all? I think, unfortunately, the idea I mean, first of all, I'm going to say that I think the best reason to participate in any type of physical fitness uh especially weight training any type of combat sports is not the idea that you know you're gonna unleash it on someone that you're finally going to be able to <laughs> stand kidding. up for your, yeah no i know i know you are the civil war. but I, I i think like the the way that you're gonna get the most out of that the way that your skills are gonna progress the most and the way that you as a person will develop the most is if you're, you know, you're not doing it for outward validation or some hypothetical combat situation, but for your own self-improvement, for your own self-development of sort of pushing the limits of what you are able to do, expanding the possibilities of your, uh, of your physical and mental threshold of just developing a skill on a linear path and the ways that that can make you improve at other things in life. Um, unfortunately though, when I say all those th- those things, they sound like incredibly conservative to a lot of people, I'm sure. That's and sad, though. It is sad, but I think that type of thinking is just, it is unfortunately kind of thought of as conservatives, uh, conservative. Um, there are an increasing amount of people like on the left training and doing these things, but I, I it doesn't, it seems to be a more popular thing on the right still. Yeah, um, it's unfortunate. And yeah. yeah, I think that also probably goes to like the whole right valuing like the idea of like men are men, <laughs> you know, yeah. manly and ugh, and Hulk and like testosterone and um 
And yeah, I mean, that might not to say the all the writers like that, like Ben Shapiro, I don't think is that kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they definitely, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, like, the, the thing is, though, like, America doesn't have, like, a fighting culture. Yeah. Like, th this is, like, a country of talkers. And if it does get past <laughs> talking, you know, you, you like, you, your life gets ruined. Every bad thing that can happen happens to you. You're like, I'll show them. And then you kill, like, 12 people who you've never met in your life. Like, this yeah. isn't a country where, like, you directly confront whoever did whatever to you, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's definitely not like a fist fight culture. Um, I, you know, talk about talk about similar talk about parallels to England. I mean, they're way more of a they're may, way more of a like a walk up on somebody directly, like to, uh, have a fist fight with them culture, despite what we may think of them. That's just that's, we're we're really not like that. You know? We're like passive aggressive kind of, even though we're, our culture is extremely aggressive, like internationally. It's like, if you look at American movies, it's always like, I'm going to show them by being super successful and like yeah. becoming a billionaire and then like making myself really hot. So like, you like the nerd becomes like a sexy guy when he grows up and like all the girls want him. And then he goes back to his high school bullies and he's like, you know, <laughs> yeah. ha ha, who's got the last laugh. That's yeah, America. No. It's, yeah, it's just not like, it's not like, as much as people like want it to be, it's like weirdly not a direct confrontation culture. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I would, I would, I would argue like getting, getting less. So, I mean, people, people think it's getting more so because you're just, you're seeing every instance of it happening because it, you know, everyone records everything. It's the only exciting thing that they'll see for years is two people having a freak out <laughs> at each other in public. But the I, like videos of public freakouts and arguments and fights in America are they have a particular weirdness and awkwardness to them just because it is so foreign for us, I think. Yeah. So like I, I, I would. I, yeah. Yeah. Performative. That, that's kind of like why I don't really I, I don't like love direct comparisons of America to like Weimar Germany or like um, predictions of a second civil war, because it's like. You, the, there's so much effort that goes into that that I at this moment like can't see Americans do like like people love Nazi Germany comparisons and like you know yeah we we've, uh, we've said like Fourth Reich on this show but referring to the American Empire I think at home what equivalent the only equivalent that America has to the SA would be like police officers right yeah I can't or like, like immigration enforcement yeah yeah but outside of police who are you know, paid like $200,000 a year to be in this role. I cannot picture a volunteer force of like a million plus Americans. And if you scale it for population <laughs> versus like 1920s Germany, it would be like what, like 10 million Americans or something of like a million, like 10 million plus hardened American uh, war veterans, <laughs> like, uh, like ideological and disciplined. I don't, do you see that? I don't. I yeah, I don't know. I go back and forth because like, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying. But on the other hand, like these really smart people will like make these per like there's like a slew of books and articles in the last few years, especially because of the Trump phenomenon and that whole era. And then the January 6th, who are like these people who are like worried about the risk of a civil war in America. And we're like such a divided society full of weapons and mistrust of the state and media and the news and it makes us paranoid and we have like racism and religious extremism and social polarization and poverty and on and on and on. And like, there are political scientists like, uh, like Barbara Walter wrote a book called, uh, how the civil war start. And then you have the journalists like Stephen March wrote a book called the next civil war. And like, they speculate on these possibilities. And then you also have like Stephen Simon, who was this national security council official in the Obama and Clinton white houses who wrote an article earlier this year that was called, we need to think the unthinkable about our country where he talks about like how a year after this is, I'm quoting him a year after the January 6th storming of the Capitol, the United States seems perhaps even more alarmingly fractious than and divided. And then he says that the media has created this like separate domestic reality for millions of Americans. And that reminds him of what he like, or well, actually it reminds me what he says reminds me about like the former Yugoslavia and of divided societies in the middle East. And also like, I think, to a certain degree, like, I think sometimes we don't realize, like, how quickly things can descend into, like, chaos and neighborhoods fighting each other. Yeah. Because I've just seen it. I've seen it happen in, like, the Middle East. And that's mostly when, like, 
the state collapses or becomes very weak and can't like enforce anything. Um, so I guess anything's possible in the U S but I think it would take something bigger than like rioting at the Capitol. Like it would have to be like yeah, a huge yeah. crisis, like hurricane Katrina times a lot <laughs> across right. the country. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right. Never say never. And like the, the like all those conditions are certainly possible in our lifetimes where there is a precipitous decline in American quality of life. Like a, you know, a, a, a line shaped graph, like, there's no more next day delivery uh, that, that, that there is um, a standard of life that is like unthinkable for middle class Americans currently. Right. I think if that happens, like, yeah, all bets are off. I think, though, I, I'm not sure you would really see like a two sided civil war. I think you would see something incredibly weird. Because it, it's so hard to sustain any popular or big movement in America without it immediately fracturing just because everyone wants to be the star. Everyone yeah. is so, you know, infected by that, that, again, all bets are off. So who who knows what that would look like? I, I, would, <laughs> I, 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 I hope not to find out, but maybe we will. What can that, you do that's one funny. way or the other? You'd have like fractured, you have like different militias fracturing. It's kind of like what happened in Syria. You have like different militias yeah. fracturing more and more. Cause like, and America is even worse because it's so individualistic. And like you said, everyone wants to be a star and wants to be the leader of the militia. So yeah, it would be, I, you know, there's some people I know here who would love to see a civil war in America. I, I don't want to see that, but they're the accelerationist yeah. types who are like, ha ha ha, let them, you know. Let them have I, to deal I'm, with what yeah. they sow, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm totally like I am. I like disagree with that, right? But I, I am like completely sympathetic to it. Yeah. I, I am. I'm sympathetic to like watching, watching all of this for the past like at least decade. Uh, you know, reading reading history, reading history of American politics. It's hard to do all that and not like not like get so discouraged that you're like, all right, let's let's see how it goes. Let's let's, let's <laughs> try it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I do, I, I get it. I don't want it, but like, I, I definitely get feeling that way. <laughs> well, also, you know, speaking of 2024, which is not that far away from now, and speaking of horse race politics, yeah. who's your money on for the Democratic candidate? Like, honestly, you know, Brandon. there's a, we can have Bernie's with Brandon. Like at this point, yeah, you really, really. Absolutely. Like, how would that, how would that, how would they'd have to like pull a rabbit out of a hat, I feel like, to make him, they, like, I don't even know how many, how much more can they inject in Joe Biden to like keep him awake? He just, one last summer, they just, one summer of speed balls. They need it like I mean, one summer of like whatever, <laughs> like, co uh, whatever concoction has killed like eight SNL cast members. <laughs> just one, one summer, one summer, like, okay. Um, we're not getting heroin like we used to from Afghanistan, but no. you know, you can, you can, you can get, have you ever seen the movie drugstore cowboys? No, that sounds like an awesome title though. It's a, it's a great movie, but um, I'm just similar to that movie. They'll get like a vial of Dilaudid and there's actually like medicinal cocaine you can get and they'll just, they'll just shoot old Joe full of that. And <laughs> honestly, like, man, even if they did it now, I say coin toss. I think coin toss election if they did it now. Really? Yeah, really? Abs absolutely. Yeah. Because he's so unpopular right now. And I yeah, think he like sucks. He, he made such, but he made a huge mistake with like, you know, the inflation so bad and the sanctions on Russia and like the war in Ukraine and then doing nothing in response to like any of the multiple crises that exist. And yeah. it just seems like, but then also you're right. Like there's no one else. Like who else are they going to run? Like they're not going to run Kamala Harris who like nobody even knows exists anymore. They are right. not going to, I, yeah. yeah. Democrat, yeah. like, th there's no Democrat, like, if a Democrat was, like, brave and competent, or not even brave, just, like, ambitious and competent enough to be like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to primary you, and this is how I'm going to do it, and, you know, you're, you know, fold, fold at the table, then they wouldn't be Democrats, right? Yeah. None yeah. of that, none of them are like that. No, it's, yeah, true. no one in this country is like that. None of them are like that. And I just think that, like, Brandon sucks. Uh, the sanctions are, the sanctions are like one of the funniest things I've seen in a in a life <laughs> of watching American foreign policy because it's just like it's this policy that has been totally uncontested forever now, like definitely for the last thirty years. 
um, where sanctions were just accepted as this like good liberal thing you do that maintains order, but punishes dictators and <clears throat> leaves people mostly unharmed. And as it turns out, like they 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 don't really do that. And it's also turning out they don't really like work. <laughs> like they, no. The moment you try to do them against like a, a, an economy with like some size on a large scale, it ends up just like backfiring on you so bad. Um, just yeah. no one, no one has had to like defend these or like think about how they would actually work for the past like maybe ever. I don't know if they ever have, but definitely not in the last thirty years. No. Um, Brandon sucks at everything else. <laughs> it's like a like completely like uninspiring uncreative set of people um i they had they had like two months of knowing that roe v wade would be overturned and they he just like they just shuffled out there and they're like yeah this sucks yeah like, even deborah they, messing they, they, is really mad at them like yeah <laughs> but it's not even it's like the, like they know mass shootings are going to happen all the time and they, they, it's like they're getting worse at speaking about them. It's like it's like they're bored with this. <laughs> it's like vote harder, yeah. vote yeah. harder. But like, but vote, again, yeah. I don't. But it's I don't know. It's just, it's such a weird polarized country, and America. You really can like punish Americans and like get them to obey. That I I could see him like keeping like most of that coalition. And it's not like so when you I think you think he'd win. So you like if you if he, oh, I think it's a coin toss. I think at this point okay, it's a coin okay. toss. I can yeah, see it I don't either know. way. I don't know. Like I just feel like I could see Trump right. Obviously, Trump's gonna run again unless like he dies. Right. And because that, you know, because bad people live a long time, I don't think he's gonna die. So um, I th if it is between the two of them, I could see Trump having like DeSantis as his VP, which he would be really smart if he did. Nah, no way. You don't think so? He hates really? DeSantis. Yeah, but like it would be smart. It would be the okay. Well, it is Trump, so maybe. Yeah, exa yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like I you know, who, 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 who are we talking about here? That's a good point. He would be he would, if he did. It would be like I think it would be a winning ticket because also like the whole country is rigged in their favor anyway. Like it, you know, it's everything's stacked against democrats and democrats are also so uninspiring and they suck that like i don't know it could it is possible and that's the other thing too is like it's almost like do democrats want to lose because it helps them raise money like they seem incapable of responding yeah. to anything and i don't know if it's because they're actually incapable i think it's a little bit that but also like the, when you have when you have fundraising emails that come out right when roe was overturned after you knew for like five weeks how else am I supposed to interpret that other than you think this is good for you politically in a weird way? Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, we've, we've said on the show, like being disappointed in Democrats screwing up the response to this is, it, you know, it's to fundamentally not understand them. It is a fundraising operation and it is a way of paying consultants and ad buyers and producers. Um, you know, I don't think in every condition they're, you know, completely cheering for these things to happen. But I think at the very least, when something like this does happen, the first thing they think about is how much money they're going to raise off of it. Clearly. <laughs> right. That's very democratic to do. But, yeah. uh, you know, and, and then speaking of like there, I think, you know, the war in Ukraine is going to be this. The, everything's boomerang. Like the boomerang effect from the war in Ukraine, I think, is also really going to hurt them. I don't know how much that'll affect 2024, but it might, especially because of the sort of catastrophic impact it's having on the economy. But what I do think is interesting about Ukraine is like you have these experts, people like there's this one guy, Michael Kaufman, who's this kind of like creature of the so-called DC blob. He's the director of Russia studies at the Center for Naval Analysis and a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. Great organization. Really lovely. He's But he's regularly interviewed on like the War on the Rocks podcast. And he's sort of like the go-to guy for analysis on Russia. So I, I wouldn't like compare him to someone like Charles Lister because at least Kaufman is like able to speak the relevant languages and is like a trained military expert. But anyway, like back in April, which was... Or, Two, it was like almost two months out. Yeah, it was two months after the war had started. He tweeted, and I'm quoting his tweet, that the decisive period of the war was the first three weeks, maybe even the first four days. Whatever happens in this next phase, 
the Russian military is likely to exhaust its offensive potential in the near term. And the reason I note that is because that tweet has not aged well. And now we're in July. And in the last few weeks, we've seen the Russians make slow but, you know, inexorable pro progress. And we've seen more and more like articles discussing the poor morale of Ukrainian forces and their desperate situation, like eating one potato a day and like dying like hundreds a day. So this is not to gloat or anything, obviously, because people are suffering and like dying in war is terrible. Um, but it does remind me of Syria when in the first months after the Russian intervention back in 2015, there were predictions that they would get bogged down in the Syrian sands. And yet then they helped the regime retake East Aleppo, East Ghouta, Pal Palmyra, and Southern Syria from insurgents. So like how long before people get sick of Ukrainians and take down the blue and yellow flags? And we see articles critical of Zelensky who went from like clown to hero because I just don't see a situation where Ukraine can win. And we all know they can't. I think people like, no already checked. No one I, th I think like people have already checked out completely yeah yeah no well i like in record time <clears throat> in record time but both because it like it became clear that like yeah this is like an awful brutal war with like no actual feel-good moments that like maybe it's not going exactly as well for the ukrainians as uh it, you know it's been portrayed in american media um, not to say that it's going like uniformly amazing for Russians because it's, it's not, but to hear people tell it, uh, over this time, you know, surrender on the Russian side is imminent. And that just is not the case. Um, the, the losses on the Ukrainian side daily seem to be, I mean, I, I just, I don't know how they could keep it up. You know, I mean, obviously yeah. all, all bets are off when you're invaded, all bets are yeah. off. But it, it seems unsustainable. Um, I, I, I would, I would hope that maybe one consequence of there being less of a fervor on the American side would be that it, it, it becomes more attractive for there to be a political solution, whether that's like giving up parts of the East or whatever it is. I don't know. Um, I would hope that. Um, I don't know if that'll be the case. Um, if, if I had to guess, I would unfortunately guess that there will be a lot more, uh, just pointless death and, uh, yeah. sorrow. Well, if, if the past is any, <laughs> is that, is any like a uh, hint to what could happen like in any, in any war and also like in a proxy war kind of situation where you're just like fueling, fueling it to keep going indefinitely. It's just like, you're going to see the call, just such complete shattering of society. It's never going to be able to be put back together. Um, I, I do have to say though, it's been interesting to like watch it happen from, from here in the middle East, because it's like people here don't care. Um, and the Europeans and the Americans, the Europeans more than the Americans, the Europeans are like, why? Like, why don't they care? Like, why don't they care about the Ukrainians? And it's like, dude, people here are just happy. It's not happening here. Like there's, I mean, it's like war is sad and like, yeah, that sucks. There's also some super pro Russia people because like anywhere in the global South, there's people rooting against anything affiliated with the U S so this, I would imagine here, in like Lebanon, especially it would be, yeah. you know, people who yeah, are, cool. yeah. Even the, but even like the pro American people in Lebanon, like don't care. Like they're just like, yeah. I literally don't care about this war. I don't care. I, also, they want to be friends with Russia because Russia is an important country. Like no one wants to like alienate themselves from the world's biggest producer of fertilizer and like oil and grain. <laughs> like, you yeah. know what I mean? So even like, even in, in, in Iraq, it's the same. Like in Iraq it has super pro-American politicians and parties. They don't care. Like, they're just like, well, it's not happening here. And also like, I don't know. We don't care about blue eyed and blonde haired people. It's like the opposite yeah. of the way that Europeans feel. So it's just a little funny to watch like Americans be like, why, like, why does, why is the global South like not taking a stronger position on this? It's like, it's really a, guys? Yeah. It is, it is hilarious for like any Westerner to ask that. <laughs> yeah. Just go, yeah. Go ahead and stick your neck out for like the one side that's always had your back. <laughs> right. Always has had everyone's back no matter what, especially in this part of the world. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, I would imagine I would imagine uh, for them, 
it would be nice to have a proxy war where you're not involved for once. Yeah, that's literally the attitude. It's like, thank God. And it just reminds me of that one guy. I can't remember. I think he might have been Congolese. And I'm so sorry if I'm getting that wrong. But I remember seeing a video of him. He was like trying to get out of Ukraine. And the the reporter was like, why don't you stay and like fight for the Ukrainians? And he was like, I'm African. Like, I don't, why would I do that? Like, why yeah. would I do that? And the guy was like, so the reporter was like, but why? Like, why wouldn't you? It was just a really funny back and forth that kind of just showed how dumb people from the West can be. One of those, um, one of those like news agencies that's, um, I forget which one it's called, uh, begins with a V. But uh, you know, one of those Voice things. Voice of America? Became... No, no, it's not Voice oh. of America. It's um, it became one of those like Eastern European ones that became very popular in the early days of the war. Uh, but they were they were saying like, they they put a poll out that were like, don't you agree that the African students should stay and fight and earn their visas? <laughs> and it's like Jesus fucking Christ! Wow, they're really feeling themselves. They're really just to openly say it like that. Jesus fucking Christ. Sorry. The arrogance, the arrogance, yeah. the arrogance. Uh, <laughs> sorry to all the children watching. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so I actually, you know, I think it's interesting too what's happened in the U.S. is you have this like sort of group on the far right, the sort of like Marjorie Taylor Greene types who've taken these positions against the war in Ukraine, against the, you know, $40 billion to Ukraine. Kind of like, you know, you also see people like her talking against, uh, against the extradition of Julian Assange. I think this is super opportunistic. Like I think if Trump was in charge, you would not see those statements from someone like her. I think it's just purely like anti-Bidenism. Um, but I do see some people, and I wanna clarify on the online left, cause I think that's like an important distinction to make. But some people on the online left are like, wow, like Marjorie Taylor Greene has a really good position on this. And like Tom Massey is actually like really good on this. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not saying like you shouldn't be happy that politicians are saying those things. But I kind of feel like there's this creeping like obs not creeping idea of like, oh, like maybe there are people on the right we can work with. And I just I personally feel like those people are not people you can work with. Like maybe people in Congress can work with them on certain bills. Right. But I do not think Marjorie Taylor Greene has like your interest at heart in any way or like freedom at heart in any way. And I think she would turn immediately if a Republican was president and support all I, of those policies. Yeah. I will say that like just between the two, I believe Massey way more than yeah. I believe Green. Yeah. Like, he's, yeah. No, he's they're, they're, they're both like, they're both like <laughs> lunatics, but he's like, there's some consistency to his worldview and you right. can point to you can point to votes he's made like under Republican presidents or like bucking the party in, in some regard with Marjorie Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's more like, yeah, this is a celebrity. This is the new type of politician, the type of which we're mostly going to see for at least the near future. Um, I, I, I am sympathetic to people who get excited about that because there is a sense of there being no bench on the left and there being a vacuum i think there there are some there are some people to feel encouraged about but it certainly is not easy to feel that way and in a vacuum you know you look for anybody in any proximity to any power who is talking about assange and that's very that's few true. people that is very few people happily uh ha luckily like uh ilan omar has talked about it um but it is, it's not a popular thing to talk about. No, um, it's, un it's really yeah. unfortunate. And it is really, it is really sad that Marjorie Taylor Greene is like one of a handful of people, if even a handful might be too many, who's like even saying anything. And that does say a lot, but it's also kind of like, there is this notion of like, from the sort of like Steve Bannon, right? Of like, oh, we can co-opt people on the left to like support like the sort of disaffected Bernie Sanders person. And I don't think it works. I actually don't think that's working at all. But on the online left, there's like maybe a little corner where it might have worked a little bit, but it is what it is. I just have a couple more questions for you because I know I've taken quite a bit of your time, but I wanted to see, like get your take on the obsession with cancel culture. So like a few years ago, I think I, I, I was like kind of always reacting to the way identity politics was being used. Like I think when I started out on the left, I probably was a bit, I was an identitarian. Like I, that was kind of like my entrance into the left. That's and so I like- impossible not to be in America. 
Exactly. And then I kind of like became very anti that and like went hardcore, like no class and class is the issue. Like I think class is obviously the, the main, most important issue that like brings us all together in, me in, in more ways than anything else can. But I also think the other issues still matter. But I went through that phase where I was like, yeah, like, you know, screw identity politics. It's like very, like very rigid black. I was very black and white about it. But now like looking back at like both of those versions of myself, I feel like there's this like obsession with, first of all, blaming identity politics for everything bad that's happening. Like, I think identity politics is definitely a problem, especially the way that liberals use it. But I don't think it's responsible for turning people right wing. I don't know that cancel culture is responsible for turning people right wing. And I feel like nowadays it's like it's like it, it's like every comedian just talks about cancel culture in like a cheap way. Everyone talks about it and actually climbs the ladder like career wise by talking about it and by pushing taboo topics and then claiming cancel cultures after them. And I kind of wanted to get your take on this because I feel like you and I kind of both be, you know, became publicly political around the same time and saw these sort of like different phases of how identity politics was getting treated. And I just wonder like, how do you see the sort of evolution of how important those issues are? And do you think they're turning people right wing or do you think that's like a stupid way of looking at it? Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to say. Sometimes it's a very futile exercise to try to get in, inside anyone's mind. Uh, yeah. You know, I um, I would say I've I've I've, I've uh, been on uh, been on all sides of this issue. You know, <laughs> I've I, I, you know, um, like 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 you said, if you came into the you know like online left politics in like 2013, 2014, you were you just like associated like a certain type of like identitarianism with the left, just because it, you didn't really see a lot, a lot of other ways of doing it in America. If you were of a certain age, um, I, you know, I, I think, I think we have about the same opinions <laughs> there, but um, with like cancel culture, like whatever you want to call it specifically, um, just me personally, I, Look, I've I've been on the side of it where it is all I can think about and I all I can think about is like how unfair it is to be like taken out of context and for like whatever thing you said to be made like a whole thing uh forever. I've I've been on the side of it of sort of trying to preemptively tailor what I say to the point where it's no one's going to be able to do that to me, which is, you know, as futile an exercise as only talking about this uh and yeah. only focusing on this um just as far as like entertainment i think that like unfortunately the best approach you can take to it uh, take with it as like an entertainer is except that like people are going to be unfair to you and then other times you are going to say things that um yeah you know you can't really defend in good taste except for the fact that you are entertaining that it's it's funny um, but the only way, the only way to like keep doing it and not go insane is just to not really think about it one way or the other, to not completely alter yourself or alter your, your content to either preemptively censor yourself or apologize, but then also to neither, neither do that, nor, uh, only talk about it. Only talk yeah. about how stupid it is. Only talk about how bullshit it is. And, it, you know, there a lot of it is, like, stupid. And a lot of it is bullshit. But I'm sorry. Like, no one <laughs> no one wants to hear anyone with the easiest job in the world complain about their job, no matter how unfair whatever thing happened. Is podcast you know, the easiest it, job in the world? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, like, internet entertainer is, like, it's up there. But, uh, you know, I... um. Yeah, it, it's I, I people talk about it less now because I think like summer of 2020 was so insane that I think it blew out of a lot of uh, a lot of people's receptors. Right. Mm. Because it's you saw this like ma potential mass movement, this like very popular thing that could unite all types of people and was uh, this thing that if, it seemed like more of a potentator for like a type of social change that we had not seen in like decades, decades, decades. 
But then it just got filtered through the stupid way that we produce and consume media. And it just became like, all right, um, uh, like Gushers apologizes for this ad that we did in 1999. <laughs> we're, take, we're taking this episode of Friends out of circulation. We're doing this. We're doing that. And it just it got filtered into like celebrity apologies and like intro media stuff that no one cares about. And I think it exhausted everyone and it exhausted everyone from like a type of hyper cynical uh, corporate uh, media interpretation and entertainment industry interpretation of a type of identity politics. And we've certainly seen the backlash to that. Um, I don't know where we go from that, though. Yeah, that's real. By the way, Gushers. Oh, my God. I think it's poison, but I loved those when I was a kid. Yeah, they were really good. Probably, yeah. They were so They're good. good. <laughs> There's, I haven't had them. So I've, I haven't had gushers in like 20 years, but I definitely ate too many of them and probably got cavities from it. But I, they've got, that is true though. Like every, every brand was apologizing and it was like so disingenuous. And also it's like that performative aspect of just, of just like taking like that easy route of dealing with major social issues without anything actually changing anything syst like systemically uh, yeah. is also I, what exhausts yeah. people. And I also like, when people like people love these like um these writing these articles in like 2017 and 2018 they're like the cancel culture is real and it's good you know but it, it all that always struck me as like incredibly stupid because i don't know it's just like if you if the only way if the only way that like you're going to get like entertainers is that you're already saying you like don't care about one way or the other to like say the right thing is just for fear of like people getting mad at them then they're gonna drop that the second that people won't get mad at them for it right you know right not to say that like no one could be offended by anything like any entertainer says obviously like yeah no everyone has different tastes and i've you know i've said a ton of things where if people get mad at me for him it's like yeah i get it i completely get it not everyone wants to read like a joke where i'm hanging out with hitler at like 11 a.m. <laughs> you know, on right. a Wednesday, but yeah, it just I, I just always thought that was counterproductive and, and stupid, yeah. and it had a it it was. I mean, talk about American, just a, an overemphasis on how we view uh, entertainers and media. Not just entertainers. I mean, I've, I know I, I know people who've like who's ha who've had their careers like destroyed over mm -hmm. literally being canceled over like a tweet or a comment like they made in jest or, and it's, it's definitely unfair. And I agree. It's like a, it is a problem. Is it the biggest problem in America? I don't think so. Oh no, absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. Right. Yeah. And there's this like attempt to frame it as though it is the preeminent issue. Like the, the biggest issue is like cancel culture. And it's like, okay, come on. Like, let's be serious here. Like, okay. Yeah. It's a problem. It's a cultural problem. Like I don't want people's careers to be destroyed because they tweeted something 15 years ago that was like unbecoming. Um, or because they said something like in, in, you know, passing that maybe they shouldn't have said, like, it depends on a case by case thing, whatever. But like, I don't think that this is like, I feel like it gets so much attention. Like, and I used to be the one giving it a lot of attention. Like I, I've been on all sides of it. I've been, I feel like yeah. I've been canceled before. Like, I Absolutely. think you've probably been canceled before. Like we've all experienced it and it really sucks. And at the same time, it's like, dude, like, I don't know. Like we're also canceling entire countries. Like, yeah. you know, there's like, I'm right next door to Syria and like people can't, you know, fill up their cars with gasoline and they have no electricity because like we've canceled their economy because their yeah. leader, we don't like their leader. Like it's really messed up. It's like that. I feel like that's a bigger issue than like, you know, and we can give them both attention that those, those things can have attention. I just feel like one has, you know, is a bigger deal yeah. than the other. <laughs> I just, it's, it's, it's weird in America because it's always going to like swing back and forth. Right. Yeah. Like I, I, yeah. I feel like when I was younger, the thing that like most typically like, you know, someone would get the, like an entertainer would get their career screwed over on is like pressure from the right. Very generally, obviously this wasn't always the case. Um, I feel like we're kind of going back to that a little bit. Yeah. In the past like yeah. two years. Um, I think I think it's just it's gonna be part of one of those things that's just like one of the dances in American life. That's yeah, I certainly I certainly choose my words like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> about certain topics. I like choose what I say, you know, and it, it's annoying, but again, not the biggest deal in the world. But I think that's a really good point you make is like, yeah, because Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity had a lot of power in the 90s and early 2000s. Bill O'Reilly, 
to like not only get people canceled, but to get people killed in the case of Bill O'Reilly. Like there was actually yeah. an abortion doctor who was like shot. Uh, that's a big way to cancel someone. Yeah. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is it's not really so much of a question. I think it's amazing that, you know, Chapo has been able to sustain itself for so long um, and like has like this really cool built in audience. And I think it's a real challenge on the left because you have this like right. It's so easy to be a right wing like podcaster, a right wing entertainer, a right wing, you know, YouTube host, um, a right wing journalist, because there's so much money in it. Like there's so much money in right wing media that, you know, you can have like two million YouTube subscribers tomorrow. Plus those people are online like that audience is there. Um Whereas on the left, I feel like it's so much harder because we don't have like a bunch of oligarchs funding us. Uh, we have to like rely on viewers and listeners and readers. And it's usually people who care about these issues because maybe they materially like are affected by them and don't have a million dollars or don't have a hundred million dollars or even like enough money to give uh, even a small amount. So I guess, I don't know if you even have an answer to this, but my question to you is what's the secret sauce of Chapo, as our good friend Ned Price would say, the secrets, or was it Jake Sullivan? They're the same to me. I think that was Ned um, Price. It was, it was I believe Ned it was Price. Ned Price. The yeah. secret sauce. What's the secret sauce? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. It's hard. It's, it's really hard to say. Um, I think like, I think one thing that helps is um, just over the time that we've done it, um, you know, I, at the start, I honestly did not know Matt and Will quite as well as I knew a lot of other people, a lot of other friends I had online. And over time, you know, we, we were friends, but over time that kind of that grew and we bonded to each other more. And the fact that there is there's that, that there's a genuine connection between the, the hosts of the show and that we enjoy doing it and that we are still able to like find new things and find new angles and find new things that like make each other laugh and entertain each other. That's honestly it. I mean, it, it, it doesn't hurt that we are uh, so much, we, we are remunerated so much greater than like, <laughs> like anyone, anyone else in this space. We've been very lucky with that. That doesn't hurt. doesn't hurt our enjoyment and motivation, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, just the fact that we we like doing it and that we we think that there are new stones to unturn always and there's always yeah. there's always going to be like a new stupid thing that happens in american politics there's always going to be like a new way to make your friends laugh um that's really it that's really it yeah that there there's a there's a, a joy in making things even if it's something as like low effort as a you know loosely planned comedy podcast right yeah, no, but I think it's really cool. And you it's a good point. Like you guys, it it's fun to listen to you guys because you give that it's like you're just sitting around talking and you're saying a lot, you're being funny, but also saying like a lot of what people think. And it feels like you're there. It's like that kind of just sitting around with your friends experience that I don't think we have a lot on the left, like especially culturally, like so much of that exists about like about celebrity gossip and about like stupid things that don't matter. So it's yeah. cool that exists about left wing politics. Um because I don't really think there's anything else like it. And you have to have that sort of cultural production that like helps people understand the world in a way they can relate to, but also like in a way that's entertaining and doesn't feel like you're, you know, receiving a history lecture from a, like, a professor in a college course. <laughs> I, will say, I will say, I will say that I think um, people are going to surpass. I think people already have. I think it's, it, it's, I think Hassan, uh, you know, I, I think Hassan has yeah. uh, surpassed us in uh, the profile and, and, and audience size. And, you know, I think I think Hassan is he's also like a singular, singular person in, in, in that space, because I, I consider him an incredibly talented broadcaster, like unbelievably so. Clearly, I mean, I, he has a yeah. massive audience like he has a massive audience, but it's just like, man, I could not I could not do that eight hours a day. And he just does like every day. It's insane. It's insane. But he can just he's able he's able to capture people's attention and hold it for seemingly like at not trying that hard. And I know that like a lot of work goes into it, but like he does make it look very effortless. 
Um, which is yeah, but, which is why it's successful. And also, he's doing it. And yeah. He's not like he's not like talking incel stuff. Like it's like he and he's not talking mm. right wing stuff. He's actually talking left stuff, which is important. Um, yeah, yeah. And but people people still find him to be like a likable, like entertaining guy, and not moralizing in any way. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think in years to come, you're gonna see people that like greatly like blow past us. Um, <laughs> what like whether they're like whether they're like more political or not just like people who come from the space to do that um yeah i i i think you're gonna see a, a bit of that yeah like the 15 year olds now maybe in five years or less you know what you know what <laughs> um i don't know how many people uh listening to this know pot about list that's it's a really funny show it's not like a political show but it's it's a really funny show uh one of the hosts on there patrick told me that he listened to uh emo prog radio hour when he was in middle school <gasps> Like God, Wait, imagine you know, that. Prague, that was in, like, yeah, yeah, we were both like, on it. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Like nine years ago. Oh God, yeah. Like, it's like grown man was in middle school listening to it. That's that, I, 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 I felt such conflicting emotions when he told me that. Like, well, actually, my okay, my first emotion is super vain, which is like, oh my God, am I that old? That's how I felt. Like, I used to be the young one. I used to be the yeah. young people. I used to be like, young people feel this way. And now I can't really say that anymore. Yeah, same. I, I actually, like last year, I was still saying that. And people were like, Rania, you're not young. <laughs> yeah. yeah, You're not young people. <laughs> it's terrifying. It's terrifying. When all you, like, when the, you've been young your entire life and then you're just not. Yeah, it's you know, terrifying. You know what's really, what's really scary too, uh, this is less vain, is like, I have like, an, I have nephews and nieces who are like teenagers and they have, like, my nephew had never heard what Guantanamo was. Yeah, And then I recently met someone who was like a Georgetown student who was like in her 20s. And she was really smart. No idea who Julian Assange is. And I'm just like, geez, like, wow. They just like erase this, these things. Yeah. Erase them. So I'm glad to hear there's somebody like who listened to you in middle school. <laughs> and now they're like grown and know who those people are. <laughs> it really shocked me. It really shocked me because that was like not an easy to find show. It really no. wasn't. People were not listening to podcasts like that in 2013. It was like one of the first ones. I think that it was like one of the, I, I'm pretty sure when I was on it, I was probably using like earphones or my computer yeah. mic. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. I could, Which yeah, I just I could want, not believe that. I just want, I want to, I want everybody to know, by the way, I, I want to apologize to you. I messaged you before we started <laughs> and I was like, I said, please wear earphones to prevent echo. <laughs> <laughs> and your response was, Rania, I've been podcasting for nine years. I know. <laughs> so I know. I just like, I just, I know it's like, it's just like you like autopilot, like everyone yeah. autopilots these things. Like, yeah, I tell people, like, I'll tell people who like have done it longer than me, like, oh, remember to record your own audio. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> I actually forgot to tell you that, but I probably should have, but I think this should be fine. But yeah. on that note, on that note, Felix Biederman of Chapo Trap House. Thank you so much for joining me for more than an hour to talk about many different topics. I really My appreciate, pleasure. really, really appreciate your show. Um, and I'm sure, you know, everybody is probably already knows of Chapo Trap House. I don't need to be the one to plug it, but if you haven't listened, you should. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.